feels so weird to like enter from just there. <laughs> okay, let me just uh, fire this up again. Cool. Um, so I'm not Casey Ellis. If anyone's not sure about that, I'm about eight feet shorter than Casey Ellis, and my hair's kind of like dark and grey as opposed to blonde, and um, I don't get mistaken for um, someone who's you know tipped off a bunch of um, government secrets. <clears throat> so as I said, that's Casey. That's not me. This is me. <clears throat> I'm on Twitter as Code Soda. My name's Chris. Rathke, um, everyone pronounces it and spells my last name incorrectly, so including mostly the pizza people, so uh, I just use code soda generally. Um, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Bug Crowd uh, with Casey as the CEO. Uh, <clears throat> just a little bit of background, um, I've got a wife and one child who's five months. Anyone who has children knows that's the most fun time. Um, and I live in San Francisco in an area called Noe Valley, um, which is also known as Stroller Valley because that's where all the families live. So. Uh, <clears throat> Me as a person, uh, I'm not a career security person. Um, my parents kind of put a bullet in that when they found me plugging the computer into the phone line and the police turning up when I was just a teenager and they said, do we have to take this off you or is, like, is this something we should be worried about? So I kind of stopped crawling around BBSs at that point in time and um, started learning C. So here I am, you know, a 10 year old writing C code, which got me in more trouble. And <clears throat> eventually I got into high school and met some cool, um, teachers and they pointed me in the right direction. So um, I spent a lot of my time uh, building big commercial enterprise software for mining and um, uh, engineering and health companies and then realized they do it all really, really wrong. Um, and so I left that and started doing the entrepreneurial startup thing. And so now I spend way too much time around security folk. <clears throat> so before we get into the talk itself, let me just talk a little bit about like Basically, I'm here to try to make you think differently, which is literally what the job of a hacker is, right? And let's be realistic about this, that um, it says here I'm not a developer. I am a developer. Um, I'm not a breaker or a fixer. Um, I do break and I do fix. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not a pen tester. That's, uh, that's Casey's line himself. But um, <clears throat> basically, we're here to build a better hacker, as in they talk about developers as being hackers and then security people as being hackers. Um, it's a little bit inflated. Basically, let's look at development and security practices and let's see what we can do to build them both up and essentially end up with a really tightly coupled blue team. So um, there's actually a fair few people. I thought I'd be talking to like two people that I know. Um, so just a quick show of hands, who builds software for a living? Okay, probably a bit under half. Um, and so who breaks for a living? Okay, so there's like a quarter of you don't do anything, right? Um, so who does both things? Who's involved in doing, like, building stuff? Yep. Yeah, those are the people who I um, don't envy. So, <clears throat> so, like, just looking at the situation here is that, you know, building and breaking, like, we're both really different, which is a good thing. And so, well, hey, you know, like, well, how does that work? Like, if we're both different, how can it be good? And so, if you look at that, like, it, you know, it balances out this lovely zen yin and yang that you need within an organization. And we're paid to do completely opposite things. And so the thing that we want to look at is, so how can we work together? And if you consider the, I mean, it's probably hard to see there, but the yin and yang, like, most organizations aren't sitting like that. They're sitting like that, but they kind of just bash together, you know, whenever anything happens. So looking at it, so, like, let's look at, like, a, the actual problems that come up in this type of situation. So let's start with developers and what the incentives are there. So anyone who raised their hand earlier would be absolutely um, familiar with the idea of a deadline for a new feature or a new product, and you got zero input into it, and it came from some guy in a suit who's the head of sales or marketing. And so it's like, you're going to push this out by then. Of course, that comes with the territory of like, hey, when's that going to be done? When's that going to be done? It's like, hey, go away and just let me do what I'm doing. And then you look at what the security team's job is, which is to make sure that the devs don't do anything that lets the bad guys in. 100 degrees, 180 degrees away from what the developer's being pushed to do. So if we look at this, some things to think about here is that when you consider like the idea of a hacker is that people like, you know, if, if someone's like, oh, you work in security, like, you must be able to like reset my Hotmail password for me because like people really greatly uh, overestimate like the ability of what someone can actually do. Like there's, there's people who can do like some really gnarly shit, but, you know, generally people like think that there's this whole, like, you know, they watch too many movies, basically. 
And it doesn't mean that security people are necessarily better. It just means that there's, <clears throat> they're really useful, but that can also be the pain in the ass. You're literally the guy paid to say no. And so the next, just as a, like, let's be a little bit fair, next time you're sort of like at a point where you're like, you know, smashing a hammer, a hammer against the developer's head, um, let's consider like the motives that they've been, they've been pushed with and like also think about what it takes to actually launch a, like a commercial product. So another point, <clears throat> looking at the developer's problem, all this stuff slows us down. And so what happens is that people buy products because it's got functions and that keeps everyone in a job. And if you look at the concept of OpenSSL, it's open source, so why didn't we find Heartbleed? Well, it's because they, their motive was, their, their intention was to um, keep it functional and functionally relevant. So, you know, it's been around for a long time. And there's a, a really famous saying about um, with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. But if you look at it the other way around, it's like with many eyes and the right incentives, all bugs are shallow. So they weren't incentivized to be looking for something like that. Now, come back to the, <clears throat> the security problem, which is around, hey, like, well, you know, I see all these things going on. So why won't these developers take me seriously? So where does that work? Like, you end up becoming chicken little. You become that guy that's like, hey, the sky's falling and everything's, you know, we've got to do all this really good stuff. And like, the sky doesn't fall most of the time. And so you end up having this thing where like, you become numb to the, the like, incessant sort of like, hey, this is happening, this is happening. But like, literally what's going on here is that they're just not seeing the problem. And as I was saying, the, the already, development contributes to the product, which essentially means dollars come in the door. <clears throat> and security minimizes that. But without security, maybe something will happen or maybe won't. And what's really clear is that this is how this works in organizations all the time. So let's look at what the real problem is here. Developers don't believe in the boogeyman. The guy that's already you know, got shell on your production boxes He's already like, um, has access to all your email, everything that he needs. And the devs literally like, oh, you know, whatever, like, you're waving your hands, you know, I don't really care. And so the problem for the security team is that like, amongst all the other things that they have to do in their day, they just literally don't have the time to come back and convince these developers to stop, <coughs> uh, to, uh, to you know, believe me when I'm waving my hands saying, hey, this is a real problem. And a really interesting thing here is thanks to every security vendor, particularly their sales teams, for making this a problem. <clears throat> and that while FUD is, you know, goes so far for awareness, it's also the fatigue that kicks in and then no one listens. It's hard to reverse from. So if we look at what the situation is for an engineering team, they have their tech checklist, things, test gets run, uh, when they're checking stuff in, it runs CI servers and they're using all these fancy acronyms that they change every three weeks because it's the new cool stuff. Then we force them through a security awareness training and everyone knows like even training you do yourself, like three days later, like half of it's gone. It's things that you need to do this stuff over a time, over a time period and like have it sort of drilled into you. And then add on to that like pen testing and all the other outsource companies that, you know, someone that, you know, they don't have any control over come in and produce this report and then they walk away. So in the eyes of a developer, it looks like a blocker. And so this is what happens. Okay. Ah, there you go. And I see everyone's laughing because you enjoy doing that. And laughing again because he knows it's true. Um, but what happens is that this doesn't work over the long term. And so the big thing here is, how do we get the business, the whole business, to believe in the boogeyman? And it's actually not that hard. And the, the great the, the benefit is that awareness of the boogeyman outweighs any annoying checklist that you may have. <clears throat> and the first thing is really simple. The most efficient way to get something the attention that it deserves is to set it on fire. It's a Picard management tip, um, courtesy of Casey, which is a nice, uh, nice one there. So technically, he didn't actually say this, but you could imagine that he would. Now let's look at the McAfee version. And this does make sense. The most security where an organization will ever be is straight after a breach. And again, he didn't say that, but he's burning Benjamins because it's true. 
So let's take that and look in the context of the last six months, or, or maybe you're going to touch longer. I mean, two great examples, Target and JP Morgan Chase. Oh, let's hire a new fancy CISO. Oh, hey, we're a bank. We better throw a ton of money at this now, et cetera, et cetera. And like, that's all cool. Like, you know, once we have this, once you're in that position, like, people listen. They know the boogeyman exists. And that's cool, but how do we prevent that proactively? And one of the, without pitching, the thing that comes out of that is a bug bounty is really effective all the time. So what is a bug bounty? It's basically like a contest where security researchers compete to be the first to find vulnerabilities in code. And in return, they get cash and social recognition. Um, and it all really started with Mozilla and ZDI way back in 1995. Um, then around 2010, some big tech companies started coming in, which was good for, aware, uh, good for the awareness. But it was bad because everyone knows that like all these sort of like Bay Area or you know these like up and coming startup companies that get like five hundred million dollars in funding, like they're all crazy. They just spend money on you know massages and you know sleep pods and stuff like that. And then you notice like just past there around 2013, which is uh, what we call the BBASS, which is the Bug Bounties as a Service, which is where Bug Crowd and our many, many ongoing and upcoming competitors came in. That's sort of that's starting to ramp up, but it's all really changed like end of last year when Microsoft said, okay, we're doing this. So now this is like a large, um, you know, fairly stagnant enterprise company that's like, hey, we're doing this for real. And it's kind of exploded. And so the thing here is that <clears throat> it's not just about being cheap and loud. It's a bold statement. And the thing that comes from this is that crowdsourcing this has proven to be across many different business models to be a low-risk, cost-effective way to get a desired outcome. But in the case of security, there's more than that. It's about leveling out the playing field. The economics of security testing are disadvantaged when you compare the economics of what, the hack, what, um, what our attackers have in their um, hands. And the other big thing is about introducing your business to guys like this. Um, if anyone doesn't know, this is Igor Homakov. Um, he's also known as the guy that basically owned GitHub and was like, God, he's a good guy who thinks like a bad guy. And the thing is, once you meet this guy, you start to think, so how many other people are there out, out there like this? You know, who's his, what's his neighbor good at? And so what happens here is that bug bounties can create a series of controlled incidents to be able to say, hey, the boogeyman exists. Look what this kid can do. But guess what? It's not in the press. You know, we haven't been tech crunched. <clears throat> We're able to control this. And incidents, incidents like this, like having an 18-year-old kid <clears throat> own your shit, um, is really effective. And people listen. So let's, uh, let's look at a little story here, a couple of stories. So <clears throat> this is like, this is in uh, 1995 when Mozilla kicked off their very first bug bounty. You see everything that came in initially, which was front-loaded, it kind of came in and swept the floor of all the basic stuff. Like they have a, a fresh, I mean somewhat fresh as it, from a security perspective stands, uh, engineering team who kind of really didn't know what they were doing. But you can see they very quickly, in the course of three months, got a clue. <clears throat> and then what happened is it then slowly came back up again and disappeared. And the sort of th what happens with it, this is how most bug bounty type engagements work, in that all the easy stuff gets cleared out straight away. And then a little bit later, the good guys come in. And then they find the real stuff, the, the real business logic flaws. This is the point where it's like, wow, someone could do that? Like, that's, you know, that's a serious issue. We need to, we need to do something about this. And yay. <clears throat> and so having run 125 things just like this, we see this pattern every single time. And when we say every single time, like, it's almost predictable. I can say to someone, OK, cool, we're just kicked off. This is what you're going to do in three months' time. This is what we're going to do in six months' time. Here's another example of a financial services company, um, very large, very old, um, received an extortion attempt from Eastern Europe. And so <clears throat> it was really cool. They, they basically said, hey, look, you deal with these kind of people. What can we do with this? And we said, okay, 
let's tell this guy you run a bug bounty program only for certain people. We added him in. Um, it was clearly displayed, yeah, we'll pay this much for these things. It was asking for like uh, 2,000 euro or something for, for what he was saying was like, you know, very big vulnerability. Um, put the, pushed the information to him, it came in. Um, basically, it was, it was a very simple like self XSS, which, you know, you want to fix, but it wasn't the end of the world. Um, they fixed it very quickly, and the guy was happy he got paid, and then went on to find and, and submit a bunch of other stuff. So they could have gone the exact opposite way with that and been like, okay, cool, we're calling in, you know, the police, and we're going to. You know, wherever you're from, we're going to try and do it. Like, it's like, hey, like, ultimately, like, this guy was trying to help, but he just needed a little bit of attitude adjustment. <laughs> Yay. <clears throat> There's another really good example um, of a social media company. And <clears throat> they were having a really hard time getting in buy-in from the, from the, uh, the uh, management and the engineering. And so they, yeah, hey, let's just set something on fire. So they, they gave us a ring and said, hey, let's... Uh, Let's uh, light some fires under some pieces here. And uh, basically, they had the budget to hire three more people. And I don't know if you know the San Francisco tech area, like people aren't cheap. And so, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is one of the best stories. Uh, very old, well-established e-commerce provider um, who'd been using a redacted uh, product, um, getting cleaned up results. We launched something with them, and within 24 hours, someone basically was admin of admins and owned their entire ship. And this is a company that's pulling in millions of dollars a month. And like their opinion was that they're like, yeah, you know, we're on top of this. You know, we've got an in internal team, which is great. But as we know, that internal team is not in a position to be able to look at every single thing that goes out. Great success. So if we look at some ideas that come from this, what if we turn this around? What if we actually say, hey, engineering team, like, you need to do better. We're going to allow, we're going to allot some money to augment our security team, to find issues, and we're going to pay out of that. And whatever doesn't get paid out, you know, we're going to you know, put on a big party or we're you know, going to go and buy a new iPad Airs, iPad, iPhone 6s, or, <clears throat> you know, black phones or whatever it is that um, you know, engineers are into these days. And you can do this internally as well, and we have done this with a number of organizations. And it's really, really effective. So are you ready to start? Like you kind of think yes, but <clears throat> there's some things you need to know. The first one is that bug bounties are awesome and you can get great results. <clears throat> it frees you up as a um, security um, engineer to Look after the things that you need to. You can pull the levers more than actually, like, you know, be like blinkered in, in what you're doing. <clears throat> and developers get, you know, basically, you don't have to be seeing them every day, you know, kicking them in the river. <clears throat> and the problem is, they're awesome, but they're also really hard. And when you launch something, it looks a little like this. And if you look at what, um, the submissions over a typical 12-month period look like, it just gets pretty crazy. This is the density per reporter. So you need to plan ahead. And luckily, there's a few simple things that we've picked up from running 125 um, of these for different companies. And it's along these lines. The, the single most golden rule is that if you touch any code or you reconfigure something, then it's rewardable. So whether you have to deploy something or you've, you know, there's a misconfiguration of SSL because you know, you've still got boxes, you've got to disable Poodle for, um, and, and with Nginx or whatever it may be, then pay it out. That's someone doing good for you. And the single mistake that everyone makes is they think it's, oh, I'm going to get all these bugs and <clears throat> All this work's going to be around remediating all these bugs, and what they find is it's not. It's about dealing with people. So when this starts, you have, you're going to find this, you know, things take time to fix. Like, you've got engineering teams that have, like, you know, however long their backlogs are, and you're going to be saying, hey, you've got to go fix this. They're going to be like, uh, sometime. The problem is that because you don't, you, it, it's not fixed straight away, 
someone else is going to find it. And you know what happens else after someone else finds it? Another two people find it. After another two people find it, four more people find it. And so this is all coming in. They're all going to be saying, when's this going to be fixed? And you're there going, ah. So the important thing is to make sure that you align the ex expectations before you engage uh, a crowd like that. And so <clears throat> the, important, uh, the, the big thing there is this looking at what you've got and it's, um, gauging how much volume can we handle coming in from, from a research community. And is this something we want to do publicly? Is this something we want to do privately? And a lot of that is going to come back to what can the engineering team handle? What's going to let us feed information to them to be fixed that isn't going to get them going, oh, hang on, slow down, slow down, slow down? What's going to be sustainable? So in conclusion, bug bounties are very cost effective and very highly marketable, as you see in the press. Um, but, and they do create controlled incidents, and they do help raise the awareness for the builders, the people who look after the builders, and then ultimately the people above that. Uh, it's really effective, and you should start one. Uh, but again, make sure that you look into how are we going to make this sustainable within our organization. And like, there's nothing that we're doing that you couldn't do yourself. It just means you need people to do it. Um, we've got plenty of great articles on our blog. Yeah, I, well, we work very closely with companies when, when, when they launch, with us in particular. Um, but we also have the, just to, to speak a bit broadly, we also have the actual researchers coming to us saying, hey, this company doing it by themselves, um, not playing fair, and then you know, where, where it's appropriate, we step in and go, hey, like, this guy's actually pretty much totally owned you. You really need to listen. Um, <clears throat> It is important to make sure that you do define the scope really well. Like, if that was the particular scenario, like, that's a really good bug. If I was a vendor, I mean, I am a vendor, if I was a vendor and I was using a third party and people were owning, could attack us through that third party, I would literally be like, you're out. So, and I would pay that person. Like, I'm changing my configuration. There's something that I'm doing on my page to pull in that advertiser. And so, regard, like, regardless of how they got the actual attack in, like, I'm going to drop that advertiser. Like, so, I'm not changing... I'm not fixing their problem, but my problem is that I've got a, a, a third-party vendor who is, you know, you know, hopeless. I mean, not hopeless, you know, like it's, they don't care as much as I do. So straight away, it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to deal with them. Um, this is also, I mean, that particularly, like, this is what you get for dealing with ad networks as well. Like, they're not the most, they're literally like, show me the money, and then they're out of there. But, yeah, definitely, the, <clears throat> it's a tough one. You're, you're talking about people now, so one person's going to be like, Cool, I get it. Someone who's going to be, one person will be, <clears throat> hey, um, I've, had a, I've had a quick look at this um, particular company. I've seen that, you know, basically I can inject something into them, which means I can inject into you. They're using all these places. I'd, can you help me disclose to them? That's, that's a, like, someone who's, like, a C, like, very much, like, smart about the way they go about this. The problem is that when you, like, hackers, you know, breakers generally aren't, you know, they're social amongst their own circle, but they're generally not the best people, people. So when, when they do approach, it's sort of like, oh, this is the worst thing in the world, and it's blowing up, and you know, you've got to fix it right now. And it's kind of like, OK, hang on. What are you talking about? OK, show me. And so that particular thing, you might find it comes in in like a five-line report. This company, you know, you know, here's some particular URL which is getting exposed on your page, but they're not explaining that correctly. So the, the thing there is around deciding, hey, like if I'm using things people like that, I, need, I can't just start off with everyone and anyone because I know that these vendors that I'm using are going to get owned and then it's all going to come back to me and it's just going to be a big mess. So something like that, you would say, look at the position you're in, decide on, okay, cool, like do something where I can actually start quietly. Get some good people in, let me know about things like that. I can clean up that sort of thing because otherwise I'm going to have this thing with the guy coming around the corner where it's like, you're going to get told that like 30 times a day. And they're all going to expect you to respond to them. So that's where it's about aligning those expectations and making sure that you come into this with the best interest of business and doing it in a sustainable fashion. Um, and without, I mean, not as a pitchy thing, but like because we've done so many of these things, like you can generally look at someone's um, setup and go, like, okay, cool, you should start off like crawl, crawl walk, run, basically. It's like, okay, kick off like this and avoid the people problems because that's ultimately like where half of it comes in. If you're a top five bank, 
and you say, I'll give you $25 for that bug. What? You know, how much are you spending? You know, you'd be spending seven figures plus a year on your internal security team, not to mention the people you're going out to. So you've got to kind of, and it also comes down to how much attention you want as well. If you offer, you know, $5,000, you know, as a base, like I think Google's is something that says some leet hacker word, like in the numbers. And so, I mean, you know, it's cool. I just, they're changing it all the time, so I can never keep up. And it's, you know, I'm, I can't read leet speak so well. But like they're offering a lot, so they get a lot of people looking. So part of that also is like if I'm just starting out, I'm just a small company, offer a lower amount because that's, you know, I'm not going to attract like everyone at that, at that price point. But I can use that to get started and then move up from there. It also lets me control my spend a little bit better. Get an idea of where, what sort of position I'm in, what I'm at. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're actually standing up pretty well. Okay, let's bump this up, uh, which looks great for marketing as well if you've got a marketing team. And then, you know, start to get some like you know really good reports. Yeah, well you can actually go online. Um, Jay Cran, if anyone doesn't who doesn't know Jay Cran, he's um he heads up delivery at Bug Crowd. He did a talk at DerbyCon, like three weeks ago. Was it three weeks? I oh, know time flies, right? And um, he, uh, if you can go watch that, it's online on the DerbyCon site. And he basically threw out like all these numbers. So that's a yeah, and lovely pretty, pretty graphs. Um, which explain a lot better than just throwing numbers around. Thank you. I'll be around if anyone wants to say good day. <laughs>